guys, welcome back to Graham DVM. Today we're going to talk a little bit about putting your dog or cat under anesthesia for surgery. This is obviously something that a lot of us will have to go through if we have an unspayed or unneutered dog or cat. It's a scary endeavor and it's something you're going to want to know about before you put your loved one under. So the big considerations we have when we put a dog or cat under anesthesia is what is their age, what is their health status, how do they look as far as their ability to cope with the anesthetic. These are all things that your vet is going to want to look at very carefully when they create a plan and tailor that plan for their, their needs. Of course, the younger pets we deal with are typically considered to be healthier. They're lower anesthetic risk candidates. We use a certain risk scale when we assess a pet and plan their anesthesia accordingly. The younger pets, more commonly, will be healthier. They'll tend to have fewer disease just by virtue of their age. And older pets may or may not come with diseases that come into play as we tailor those anesthetic protocols. That's not to say a young pet can't be ill and an old pet can't be healthy, but there's certainly some consideration we take into play as we plan the general protocol for pets in these age ranges. One of the first things every vet is going to have to do before they can safely sedate or anesthetize a pet is perform a complete physical exam. We need to listen to the heart. We need to uh, feel, the, feel the tummy, listen to the lungs, check their gum color, make sure they look nice and pink. Part of that uh, process is just getting a general sense of how this animal looks and learn everything we can about that animal just with our eyes, our ears, and our hands. Once we've had a chance to learn everything we can with our hands, ears, and eyes, we're going to need more. Knowing what's going on with an animal's metabolic status, their organ function is something we just can't be expected to know from an exam alone. That's where we lean on diagnostics like blood work to help us know, can these guys tolerate the anesthetics? When we talk about anesthetics, the important thing to consider is not only do we have to have an animal dissociate, which means be unaware of what's being done to them to be restrained, meaning unable to move when we're working carefully with their tissue, but they also have pain control. So these animals are going to usually be on multiple different types of medications which act in different ways on their system to accomplish all of these goals. So once we've had a chance to look at our patient, determine them to be safe enough for anesthesia, what exactly do we do when we put them under anesthesia? Now this isn't sedation we're talking about, I'm talking about general anesthesia. Let's take a look at a few things you're going to be using in this kind of a procedure. This first thing I'm going to show you is a typical uh, gas anesthetic machine. This machine, our machine delivers isoflurane, a very common gas inhalant anesthetic, um, as well as providing high levels of oxygen. So these pets are usually better oxygenated than they would be breathing room air during the course of their procedure. You can see a, uh, a mechanism that allows us to control how much gas they receive and control their depth. We've got an ability to adjust the amount of oxygen that they receive we can select bag sizes appropriate for uh, their tidal volume or the amount of air they're going to take into their lungs. And we have different types of gas delivery systems that utilize different valve structures throughout that machine um, that are appropriate for different respiratory capacities in these dogs. In order to hook them into something that's going to allow them to, to move this gas and air, we pick an endotracheal tube appropriate to their specific size. Larger dogs take bigger tubes, smaller dogs and cats are usually utilizing a much smaller tube. We want a tube to fit snugly within their windpipe or their trachea, um, not so tightly that we have any uh, trauma to that tissue, but tightly enough that the secretions in the mouth or regurgitation wouldn't find its way down the windpipe, which an animal simply can't uh, pr protect when they're under anesthesia. So once a patient is under anesthesia, the real part of anesthesia has really just begun. Once that pet is now in this state, uh, this kind of this limbo state where we're operating on them, we become entirely responsible for ensuring all of their vital parameters maintained in a normal, healthy, safe range. That means keeping their blood pressure up, which we'll use things like fluid pumps, and I'll talk about that in just a second. That involves keeping their oxygen levels up and knowing their oxygen levels are staying up. These animals sometimes have respiratory compromise from the anesthesia. Although we're delivering high volumes of oxygen, high, high percentages of oxygen, we can still see those numbers drop if we're not cautious with our delivery method. We also have to be watching these patients' heart rates 
And we do that with uh, essentially an EKG or an ECG. It allows us to not only see the heart is beating at a rate we're comfortable with, but that it's beating in a way that's normal for that dog. That beat may sound great to us when we listen, but we find out on ECG that they're having abnormal beats or that beat's coming from a part of the heart it shouldn't. That can happen sometimes as a consequence of other conditions that are complicating their anesthetic status. So all these tools, the blood pressure, the oxygen levels, the ECGs, all help us make sure anesthesia is delivered safely for your pet. When these surgeries finish, these pets are typically going to be groggy. Big things we see commonly are these pets may go home and not eat normally that first day, sometimes even to the next morning. They may not have a bowel movement for a day or two, in some cases three. Anesthesia can uh, greatly slow down that bowel transit time. They're certainly going to be sleepy and they're going to need your attention for these first day or two after the procedure. So none of these things should come as a particular surprise. But make sure you spend some time to talk to your vet about the uh, specifics of what you're going to see in your pet after the anesthetic event. Once again, thanks for taking the time to watch one of my videos, guys. Hopefully you've learned a little bit more about what exactly is happening when we send our pets in for that surgical procedure, anesthetic procedure, or sedation. If you have questions about it, just post them below. I'll be happy to help how I can. Till next time, we'll see you on Graham DVM.